interesting statement. And those that were here Wednesday night got a preview of what I'm going to do this morning in the process of bringing the lesson Wednesday in the devotional period. I gave a number of scriptures magnifying the word, and as I was going through that, it came one of the scriptures touched upon conversion, and I said, you have a preview of what I'm going to do this morning. But I'd like to begin by noticing what Jesus said to the apostle Peter not long before our Lord's crucifixion. In Luke 22, 31 and 32, Luke 22, 31 and 32, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I prayed for thee that thy faith shall fail not. Now watch the last part of it. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Peter has been with the Lord at this time for over three years, day in and day out. And the Lord still says at this stage, just before his crucifixion, when thou art converted. Now think of all the things that we read about Peter in being with the Lord during his earthly ministry, all things he was involved in. And yet he says, when you are converted. Now, I want you to hold that there because I think we'll see why that a person can be exposed to the Lord as Peter was all that time, day in and day out, day out, for over three years, thereabouts. And the Lord was still saying, and the Lord knew Peter, when thou art converted, here's what you do. I think it's important to realize that there are things Peter could not do that Peter may have wanted to do until he was converted. But I think it's safe to say at this point, after three and a half years of Jesus, Jesus says you're not yet converted. And that causes me to raise a lot of questions about the importance of what the Bible teaches on conversion. <laughs> if somebody can walk with Jesus day in and day out, being instructed and seeing Christ and how he did things and all the miracles that he did, et cetera, et cetera, and then right at the end of his days on earth, look to Peter and say, when you're converted, here's what you're going to do. So what is conversion? It's easy to use that. We use it a lot. But I don't know whether we ever sit down and just say, now let me go to the Bible and study all I can to understand what conversion is. And thus we go to the Bible to answer the question, what is conversion? And I need to answer these sub-questions. Because if Peter had been with him all day long, every day for three and a half years, and the Lord said, when you're converted, then I may need to ask myself the question, have I been converted to Christ? Or maybe I need to ask, was my conversion real or genuine? Now our study is important because salvation from sin only happens when one is converted to Jesus Christ. Converted from a life of sin habitually done without any thought of God, interested in self, to a life of being righteous or righteous living is taught in the Bible. Now I want to go further by introducing this to carry you to Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, where Luke records matters that took place in the Gentile church in Antioch. And certain came down from Jerusalem teaching that you Gentiles can be saved if you'll be circumcised, keep the law. They added that to the plan of salvation. And beginning in verse 1, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. That's pretty plain. At least we're very bold in their affirmation. When therefore, when in the light of their teaching... 
Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation. Paul's an apostle. He knows from Christ by the Holy Spirit exactly what's involved in conversion, what it takes to become a Christian. So immediately he stood up against them. He tells us more about that in Galatians. So they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem and to the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia, which is full Phoenicia, and Samaria. Notice what they were declaring as they passed through. Declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. The conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. Now those Jewish brethren who became known as Judaizing teachers believed and taught, as has plainly been said, but we remind ourselves of it, that Gentiles were not truly converted to Christ, whatever conversion means, unless they were circumcised in the flesh and kept the law of Moses. And when they had that meeting in Jerusalem, it was to determine who taught this doctrine, where did it come from, and then affirm the truth of the gospel as to a person being converted to Christ. So they were concerned with our question. What is conversion? This would automatically entail also when, when is a person converted and how, how a person is converted. Very important study. You're not going to heaven if you're not converted to Jesus Christ, period. So we ought to be concerned with the question. And we ought to ask it in this way. How can I know I have been truly converted to Jesus Christ? Because if I can't know, I can't know I'm a Christian. I can't know I'm saved. I can't know my sins are remitted. I can't know the Lord's added me to the church. I can't know any of that unless I understand the Bible's teaching on conversion. Let's make it very clear. No one can be saved from sin and brought into fellowship with God without being converted to Jesus Christ. Here's what uh, Matthew records for us that Jesus told his disciples. Verily I say unto you. Now Peter's going to be there, isn't he? Peter's going to be hearing this. He's going to hear this, yet a long time later, Jesus is going to say, when you're converted. But Peter's hearing this along with the others. Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Couldn't get plainer than that. I've often wondered what the disciples actually think, and especially Peter, when he heard this, and yet down toward the end of our Lord's life, just a matter of hours before he was dead, Peter said, when you're converted. Did Peter not understand this? He didn't fully, I'm sure, as the others didn't. Now, in the King James Version, the words converted, conversion, or convert, occurs in ten different places. Webster's Dictionary tells us that convert means to change, transform, turn as you would, for example, convert grain, such as wheat, into flour. Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words says the word implies a turning from and a turning to. Thus it means to turn away from a life of sin and turn to a life of righteous living. To turn from the devil and being a child of the devil and to turn to God and being a child of God. To turn from self and turn to Christ. And His will being done in your life. Well, that's what it means to turn to Christ. It's a change in one's state. It's a change of direction, a turning from and a turning to. It takes place when one hears the gospel, that implies understanding it, believes in Christ based upon it, and what all is involved in obeying the gospel of Christ, the gospel being the power of God to save us, Romans 1, 16, the glad tidings of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Thus we see man being a free moral agent with free will, 
that one stubborn old will that's the seat of all sin and rebellion against God <coughs> must yield in submission to the will of Christ, resulting in a person turning from a life of sin to a life of righteousness. It involves a great resolve of the heart. We learn that conversion is not a convulsion or some kind of highly emotional experience that brings forth all kinds of hilarious, at least I think it is, irrational conduct. It is a complete change of heart. Now, what does that mean? You remember when Paul reminds the Roman Christians of what they did in becoming Christians in Romans 6, 17, and 18. He said, but God, be thankful that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart. That form of doctrine which was delivered to you, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness, turning from, turning to. But notice the heart's involved. What was involved? If you serve God with your whole heart, that's the inward man. Heart's used to describe the inward man more in the Old Testament than the New. But what is the heart of man? It's the intellect, rational powers. It is our will. It involves our emotions. And it involves our conscious, conscience. When the heart evidences a total change from a practice, purpose, life of sin, not caring about God or godly things, as the Word of God plainly teaches it, and to God, following His will, His Son, His son's teaching then one is going in a completely different direction that's what is said by Paul in the Holy Spirit's own words in Romans 6, 17, 18 which we quoted a moment ago so when converted our thinking our purposes our motives our believing our faith our, in other words our confidence our trust our allegiance and our conduct changes when you're outside of Christ still in your sins not converted to Christ you're of the world you're a child of the devil when you are converted to Christ whatever the process is of being converted you're now a child of God your allegiance is to Christ first foremost in all ways that means living as he wants you to live that may be that at this point I need to say, maybe that tells us a great many of us still have one foot in the world when we get so concerned about the world that's passing away. So I want us to determine what is conversion, and in doing so, have I been converted to Jesus Christ the way the Bible talks about it, the way the Bible describes it, the way the Bible defines it. So we've been, we begin by noticing the wrong way or ways to determine whether we've been converted. The wrong ways. First of all, one cannot know one is converted to Christ simply by one's emotions or feelings. You just can't do that and determine you're converted because you feel good. Some of the most difficult people in the world to persuade with simply the truth of the gospel. Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free, John 8, 32. Are those who have strong emotional responses to things, depending on the, listen to their feelings, depending on their feelings, to assure them of their conversion. Now the reason they're that way is simply this way. They've been taught that if you have that feeling, that's a sign from the Holy Spirit you're saved. Well, if you have a bad feeling, is that a sign from God you're lost? Because the best of people have their ups and downs in their emotions. It's difficult to prove to a person who's undergone an intense emotional experience. Having been taught that such uh, an experience constitutes evidence of one's conversion or salvation, 
that they've not been saved or converted to Christ. In fact, the first thing they'll be thinking, well, you call me a liar? And people have been known to say, well, I'll take this great feeling and emotion that I have over a stack of Bibles. But you wouldn't know there was a Christianity and what it entails without your Bible, without the Word of God. Permitting our emotions to be the standard by which we judge matters of truth is simply the wrong standard. Feelings are the result of things. And we're not opposed to emotions. God made you with your emotions. And I often say it this way. God made you with your emotions to control them as He directs in His Word. Not to just let them run rampant. By inspiration, the Holy Spirit had Solomon write, there is a way. It seemeth right unto a man, but the end there are over the ways of death, Proverbs 14, 12. Do you realize that every error that man could ever come up with has already been anticipated by the mind of God and revealed in the New Testament? It truly furnishes us into every good work. I don't know what error men may come up with in 10 years or tomorrow or whatever, but I can guarantee you this, the refutation of it is found in the proper teaching of the Bible. Also, the Apostle Paul tells us, and we need to study this a little bit, for we, Christians, walk by faith. We live by faith. We conduct our lives by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 again. Now reason with me, and I'm going to plot along here as closely as I can if you'll follow. Since faith comes by hearing the Word of God, that implies understanding, Romans 10, 17. My trust in Jesus comes through the teaching of the New Testament, the gospel. Then the expression, we walk by faith, not by sight. By faith means we live as the Word of God instructs us, teaches us, leads us, guides us, and directs us. To walk by sight means that we conduct our lives according to our five senses, what we can perceive through our eyes and so forth emotions, experiences of this present world that have to do with what can be examined, we call it empirical knowledge, by the five senses, or our likes and dislikes, our opinions. We're not letting the Word of God form our views of right and wrong. We have our own view, and God forbid the Word of God should influence it. So it is that people use emotionally, fleshly reactions to something or to some event as evidence that they've done the right thing as God determines the right, rather than walk by faith. To walk by faith is like the Word of God said. If you're faithful, you're living like the Word of God teaches you to live. If you're not faithful... There's something about your life that's not in harmony with the teaching of the Scriptures pertaining to how Christians are to live. Again, let me emphasize, I'm not saying that one's emotions are evil. They need to be put in their place and understand how man's made up. God gave us these emotions, and it's great to have the feeling of being happy and relieved or peaceful to know the joy of salvation. After all, the Ethiopian eunuch, when he rose from the water of the grave of baptism, went on his way rejoicing. Acts chapter 8 and verse 9. But now notice, he didn't get the cart before the horse. He was taught from the scriptures the truth about Jesus Christ. And thus, understanding the gospel, he's the one that interrupted Philip. They said, here's water. What does it mean to be baptized? How do you know about that except that in preaching Jesus, you preach the plan of salvation, and that involves baptism in water for the remission of sins? Only when he knew he had done what the Word of God said you ought to do, did he go on his way rejoicing. So feelings have their part. Even sadness can have their part. But, you know, it can, be, uh, it can be created from a false testimony. Remember Jacob? The brothers didn't like Joseph too much. When they sold him into slavery, what did they tell their, their father? Well, they took his coat of many colors and 
dipped it in goat blood, brought it to Jacob, and said some animals killed him, devoured him. And Jacob was highly upset, lamented and cried. Was he dead? No. But evidence that was false was presented, but he took it as the truth. And it caused the same emotional reaction to him if it had been the truth. So we have an obligation to be sure that what we're believing, what we're doing is truly God's will. We could echo John here and say, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. So feelings can be and often are wrong. You can feel good when you ought to feel bad. Somebody goes to the doctor and goes a battery of tests and says, you got cancer, it's terminal cancer, nobody can treat it, we can make you feel a little better, but you'll be dead within six months or so. I think I'll get a second opinion. So you, you go get a second opinion or a third opinion or a fourth opinion. It keeps coming back the same way. But you don't feel bad. You don't feel like you're dying. Let me ask you a question. What does it feel like to feel like you're dying? I don't know. I'll have to go through it and find out. Oh, I've been awful sick. Is that what it feels like to die? You've been awful sick. Is that what it feels like to die? Well, it feels like what it is to be sick. <laughs> Nigh unto death. Close to death. But I don't know what it feels like to actually go through the process of the Spirit leaving this body and returning to God and gave it. And I won't know that but one time. So how one feels is not evidence, evidence of a scriptural conversion. Remembering Paul's feelings told him he was pleasing God as he opposed Christianity. I did that all good conscience. All while, though, he was doing evil things. He was serving Satan. He was opposing the gospel. He was persecuting Christians. Christ says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Because that's the spiritual body of Christ You're persecuting the church. So we don't use our feelings to say, well, I'm saved because I feel good. Our parents' religion is the wrong standard by which to determine if our conversion is real. According to Paul, much of his early life was spent in the tradition of his fathers. Here's what he wrote, Galatians 1, 14 through 16. And profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I confer not with flesh and blood. You know, we, we go right the opposite. We hear something and we go confer with flesh and blood. Well, granted, he was an apostle. And as an apostle, then he got his gospel directly from Christ by the Holy Spirit. But the point is, you can go confer with anybody you want to. But if what they tell you is contrary to the book you have in your hands that is a true translation of the Bible, then they're wrong. Did your parents or do your parents want the best for you? Did they always want the best for you? And the greatest of the best, of which there's no bester, <laughs> is getting you to heaven. Did they want you to have things that were good for you that they may never have had? And went through life without it? Certainly. In most cases, that's, it. that's true. This is what bothers me about people who say, well, mom and daddy didn't believe what the Bible teaches, so I'll just go to hell with them. Does that make good sense? The fact that our parents believed something and taught us to believe it, even if it was good, does not turn the error they may have taught us into the truth. And that needs to be kept in mind. So we compare and contrast everything we're exposed to, especially the doctrine of Christ, with the Bible to see if it is the doctrine of Christ or if we've been, and our question is, what is conversion? The testimony of others do not constitute proof of our conversion. Many people make religious claims, 
They believe many things about salvation. That doesn't mean, because many people do it, that their claims and beliefs are true. For a long time, certain religious people have made it a practice to offer their testimony about how they were converted and even when they were converted or saved from sin. To them, certain events in their lives are presented as proof of their conversion. And other people, having heard them, expect to have their own salvation experience, as that is called by them. However, we must remember that people are not saved by their own personal testimonies. They do not determine what is true or false with God. And besides that, when the testimony that's inspired that you find in the scriptures concerning when a person is converted and how and when is contrary to people's testimonies today and I accept them today, I'm accepting them to the exclusion of the inspired testimonies of the scriptures. Does that make much sense? Clearly we must look to a different standard that is above and outside of man by which to determine what is true conversion. So the right standard for determining must be brought out, that is, what is conversion. It must be an objective way instead of a subjective way if we're going to really know that we're converted to Christ, if we're saved. In recounting how the Corinthian church had come to Christ when Paul first went to that city, preached the gospel to them, here's what he wrote. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. And I... Brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ, Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit and the power why why does he say this that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men but in the power of God now this raises the question what does Paul mean that he came in demonstration of the spirit and power and that their faith should be in that as opposed to something else. Well, if you go down just a few verses, verses 12 through 13, here's what he wrote. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. He's talking about how Revelation, how the New Testament got here. He's speaking of apostles. That we might know the things that have been freely given to us of God. How do you know what's been given of God? You read it. Now notice what he says. These things, in other words, have been revealed to him by God. He says, these things we also speak. Now watch it. Not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. American Standard 1901 says combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. That's why Paul would say to Timothy, preach the word. That's the mind of God revealed to you and the words the Holy Spirit chose to do so. The Holy Spirit gave the apostles the words they used to reveal the mind of God to us. They were converted to Christ by those words of Christ, by the gospel. Jesus even said, you're clean through the words I've spoken unto you. In the Roman letter, Paul refers to this as the witness of the Spirit. The witness of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, third person of the Godhead. Paul wrote, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's another way of saying that we are converted, that we are saved from our sins, that we are children of God, that we are Christians, Romans 8, 16. Now this involves some study. This is not a reader's digest. It's just read over it and it gives you some fuzzy feeling or a good idea and you've forgotten it within a week or so. The Greek word that's translated bears witness with means to testify jointly. 
to testify jointly. It means to corroborate by concurrent evidence. In other words, there's an agreement between what the Holy Spirit has said and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17, and how the Spirit of man has responded. For some reason or reasons, many people jump to the conclusion that when uh, uh, the Holy Spirit is said to be involved in anything, that it must be some mysterious in, uh, thing uh, involves some sort of vision or inner voice or some kind of special feeling, uh, a better felt than told experience. But this is not the case at all. Not at all. Remember what Paul said that we read a moment ago in verses 12 and 13 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that the Spirit gave the apostles words to speak by which to convey spiritual things or spiritual truths. So the Holy Spirit gave the gospel message to the apostles for them to preach to others because it's God's power to save. And they wrote it down along with other inspired men. And they did that so everybody could believe and obey and teach it to others. And they would know what conversion entailed. The gospel message comes from the Word of God, which the Holy Spirit produced. The power of conversion is not an experience or a feeling or an inner sense of some kind. The power of conversion is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Word is the Spirit's means of converting the sinner to Christ. The psalmist wrote this, plain language. The law of the Lord is perfect. And this is one of the verses I use Wednesday night. Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Psalm 19.7. In Romans chapter 8, Paul writes that the Holy Spirit bears witness with or testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's no subjective, relative, inward feeling, but it's an absolute objective evidence whereby we know we're saved by Christ or converted to Christ. Since the Spirit has testified of Christ and salvation in His infallible Word, the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11, how can there be agreement between the Holy Spirit and my spirit or your spirit? The answer is simple. There must be an agreement between what the Spirit has testified to the gospel in the gospel and how we've responded to that gospel. The gospel says you must hear the gospel. All right, have you heard the gospel? Do you understand it? There's no use going any further until you can check that off your list. If you've heard the gospel, has it created faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God? Yes or no. If you've repented of your sins, we've discussed that, breaking down of the old human will, the seat of all sin and rebellion against God, and a turning from and a turning to. It's where we die to sin. Have we done that, Acts 17 30, by keeping that commandment? Have we confessed our faith in Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10, 10, Matthew 10, 32? If we have, I'm going to say to you what Ananias said to Saul when he was in that position. Now, why tarest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord, appealing to the authority of the Lord by complying with what he said and doing it from the heart. So clearly the New Testament tells how people are converted and when they're converted to Christ, when they're saved, they're synonymous terms. The New Testament of Christ reveals how the apostles went forth and watched what they preached to convert people. If we honestly believe and obey the same things the apostles preached to those in the first century, then we can today in the 21st century right now be converted to Christ in the same way they were. For we have the same gospel message and it's still the power of God to save. We have our same minds about us and we can know we've complied with what the Spirit taught in the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. Thereby we have the assurance of the Holy Spirit through the sword of the Spirit, <clears throat> which is the Word of God, that we have been converted to Christ, that we have turned and turned again and turned away from a life of sin and turned to the new life in Christ. And thus when you rise from the water to your grave of baptism, your sins are remitted and you walk in newness of life. You're a new creature in Christ. Behold, old things are passed away. 
all things are become new. That's conversion. Some of us are trying to get the world to live like the converted when we're getting ahead of ourselves. You can't expect people to live the converted life when they're not converted. The first necessary step in conversion for those who believe in God is so that, is that they must hear the Word of God. That's where we are. That's the reason the gospel is in our hands, that we're to preach the Word so people can hear it, and we're to preach it to every Christian. It's impossible for a person to be converted without hearing the gospel, and so on down the line. We have studied these things to understand what is conversion. Have I been converted? How do I know when somebody's been converted? Faith is important, but it always comes by the teaching of the Bible. I've said it over and over again more times than I can remember. If you say, well, I believe this is what God wants me to do, you ought to be able to turn to the New Testament and find where it's explicitly said or implied. And if you can't, you have no business saying it's a matter of belief in God connected to Him. We preach some good-sounding things to people around about us, but we need to apply it to ourselves and say, I believe this, all right, if you believe it, then you ought to be able to find it in the Bible. So we need to hear the gospel, repent of our sins, confess our faith in Christ, and obey the truth. I want to end up on this point. Peter said baptism is the answer or the appeal of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, 1 Peter 3.21. Jesus of the Great Commission, Mark 16, said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that doesn't believe is going to be condemned. Why will we fight against the simple, powerful words? Why will people oppose him? Men and brethren, what shall we do? After they were converted to the belief in Christ as Son of God, that's what they asked on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 37. The truth had pricked them. They didn't fight against it. And Peter told them as believers, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and all of them that be afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And this is what we preach as the gospel teaches. Are you converted to Christ? Those of you that were baptized a long time ago, was your whole heart involved in the matter? Did you understand? Do you see why it is, as I close, that we emphasize before we baptize somebody, do you understand what you're doing? Do you understand that you are lost in sin and if you died right now, you're going to hell forever? Do you fear going to hell? Do you love Jesus because of what the Bible says? If so, you're ready to do just exactly what Ananias told Saul of Tarsus to do. Rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If you won't do that, you won't be converted. As a child of God, have you sinned? Are you willing to repent? Turn away from those things and turn back to Christ wherein you left him. Confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. That's God's second law of pardon. But if you're subject to the gospel invitation, we urge you to think about these things as you consider your own conversion and do so while together we stand and sing.